preach and say amen. Yes. That'll preach, buddy. That'll preach. That will preach. Amen. That's good singing, girls. Thank God for them girls. And they'll sing anywhere. They sing out in front of Walmart. They'll sing in a restaurant. We've been ejected from several of them. <laughs> Amen. No. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's take our Bibles now and open to the uh, book of 2 Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Last you pray for us tonight. The Lord put this on my heart a couple of weeks ago. Second Timothy chapter two. Well, the Randy's already challenged us not to quit. I'd like to do the same thing tonight. I was taught when I first got saved by great men that you don't quit no matter what. You hear what I'm saying? Some people say, but, no, ain't no buts. You don't quit no matter what. It don't matter what happened. It don't matter what happened to you, for you, against you. Don't quit because you're tired. Don't quit because you're hurt. Don't quit because you're bleeding. You don't quit no matter what. You don't quit. The devil can't do nothing with somebody that won't quit. He loves it when people quit. God don't call people to quit. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You say, I'm discouraged. Go on anyway. You say, I'm timid. Suck your thumb while you go and just keep going. Don't quit. Don't, don't, just don't quit. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Thou therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness. See that? Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard. I endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. I want to preach tonight on the Pony Express. Tonight, uh, to introduce the message, you're going to have to think with me for a few minutes, and we're going back in American history. We're going back in American history about 145 years to the year of 1860. It was an exciting time, but you got to remember that in 1860, there was no telephones, there was no telegraph, there was no television, there was no way to get word from one half of the country to the other half of the country except by a man taking it, by stagecoach. This sometimes took a month or two months or several months. When President Lincoln was to be elected president in 1860, um, I, will, I will talk about that in a minute, there would have been no way, if here it happens on the East Coast, it would have been a month before they found out who won on the West Coast. That's hard for us to imagine now, but that's the way it was. It was, it was there's no way to get the word to them except by stagecoach. And that took many many long, hard days and hours. So somebody come up with the idea of the Pony Express. You're going to be familiar with it in just a minute, and I want to compare that to our life for God, especially preachers and you young men here tonight. I'm recruiting for young men tonight to get in the army for God and ride that pony and do what the Lord would have you to do. See, during, during this time, somebody said, why don't we do this? We're going to get some ponies, the best little ponies that money can buy. We're going to make relay stations across the country. They divided up the country. It's pretty easy to get to Missouri, St. Joseph, Missouri. 
That's where a lot of stuff on Bonanza took place from that part over. And they, they, they made relay stations. Over a hundred of these relay stations between St. Joseph, Missouri and Sacramento, California. And what they'd done is these guys would take the mail, they'd put it on their, their saddlebags, take off on their pony, and they would ride 75 miles. Every 75 miles, there was a relay station where the young man could stop and get a fresh horse or the other next young man would take over for him. They, this Pony Express only lasted for 18 months. And the reason they stopped it was because that the telegraph was invented. And after the telegraph was invented, of course, they could send that code, you know, across the country. And if it hadn't of it, it went on for years. Only 18 months, but my, 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 what exciting times and what wonderful, daring, dashing stories go through our mind. And you've seen it on movies. I, I sent my girls to get a, an old movie they made up, Bonanza, when I was studying this. They got it stuff off the Internet for me. And uh, my, it was an exciting time. The fastest they ever made it from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California was 11 days. That sounds like a long time to us, but that's, uh, you know, across the country, 3,000 miles. And on a horse, that's a long way. 75 miles on a horse is a long way. That's like riding from here to Charlotte on a horse. A lot of you folks that say, well, Oh, it wouldn't that be wonderful and romantic to it right now? Oh, it ain't like where you go to a stable and pay five dollars and they saddle it for you and you go down a little sweet trail and then come back. Wasn't like that at all, son. It was hot and it was desert and it was dangerous, as we'll mention in a minute. Eleven days when President Lincoln was elected, they made it from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast in 11 days. They did not take the stagecoach route. They took the shorter by the old Oregon Trail. They went down by the Platte River across Nebraska, south of the Salt Lake Sea there in Utah, in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, and finally down over into California. On Bonanza, they had one episode, if you like Bonanza, you remember that, uh, where little Joe himself was a Pony Express rider. Did you ever see him? Boy, I'll tell you, that was good. Little Joe was going down up there, and boy, he signed up. He got to be a Pony Express rider, and it showed him going down through there. I mean, I think they sped the film up a little bit. Uh, he was doing a 99 miles an hour. That little old pony's legs are just going like that uh, down across that desert as he left and carried the mail. You see, over in California, there were thousands of people who were waiting to hear. They didn't know if their wife and kids was alive. They didn't know if everything was all right back home, and they were over there digging for gold, waiting to hear good news yeah. from a far country. Yeah. And what a sight it was when that little pony come into that life station and delivered the mail and put it there. Now I want to say tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that God has called me and you to deliver the mail. It's our job. It's our job to take this to every creature in this world. We have a commi commission to take the gospel to every creature and by the grace of God that's what we ought to do and get on it. I started out, I got on my pony uh, at 19 years of age. I was saved when I was 18. A few months later, I said, Lord, I want to be one of them little guys. And he put me on my pony and I've been riding him ever since. Now, I'm going to tell you through many dangers, tolls and snares, I still, by the grace of God, I mean, boy, I tell you, I've had pony wrecks, had my pony shot out from under me. I'm telling you, boy, we've, we've been over cliffs and down sides of mountains, but by the grace of God, here we are going into 2005, uh, just still riding by the help and grace of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want to talk about this a little bit tonight and bring you the message on the Pony Express. You listen, I'm only going to say three things and then we'll pray out the old year and in the new year. I want to say the first thing I want to talk about tonight is the demands on the rider. The demands on the rider. There were certain demands demands that had to be put on these boys. Just any little old fella couldn't be a Pony Express rider. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry couldn't be. I mean, you had, they had 200 hand-picked men, and it was in those exciting days of the Wild West, and boy, every young man heard about it. 
He's a dashing, daring young man. He said, man, I want to be one of them. So he come, and they would stand in line. I brought some stuff to illustrate this tonight. I got this uh, uh, several years ago when I was out in Texas, and this is an actual picture of what they put up on saloons and around town when the Pony Express are just like that. They printed it, put it on this T-shirt. I got this out in Texas, and it's a Smith & Wesson T-shirt, and it said, uh, inspired by Smith & Wesson, supreme quality for extreme situations. Yeah. I like that, don't you? Extreme quality, supreme quality for extreme situation. You say, Brother Danny, I can't believe you're up there advocating guns. Well, just, just hang with me here for a minute. I'm going to move these out of the way, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. So what they've done is they took these things here. Get the rest of that stuff off there for me, Raj, will you? And I'm going to put this T-shirt up here where you can see it. And what they've done is they went all over town, and they was going, pow, pow, and putting these up. Well, all the young men seen these and they said, Lord, in mercy, I want to be one of them. Now, here's what it says. Pony Express riders wanted, effective July 1st, 1861. Look at it, boys. Young, skinny, wiry fellers. <laughs> I like that, don't you? Young, skinny, wiry fellers. Amen. We got anybody like that here tonight? I don't see many. Hey, man, uh, listen, brother. He said, young, skinny. He said, here's what we want. Anxious for adventure. You want some adventure, boys? You want some, Eric? You want some adventure? You ain't no sissy, are you? Hey, man, you young boys want some? You want some of this, brother? Look here what it said. It said, change to see the great west. Must be expert white riders willing to risk death daily. They can get killed any minute. Orphans preferred. What about that? Now, you know why they said that? Because not many people cared if them orphans got killed. They didn't want some little boy out there to get killed, break his mama's heart, or break his daddy's heart. So they said, are you orphans? You got some guts? Uh, you got some bravery? Have you got some boldness? Do you, are, are you brave? And that's what they done. And so I want to put that right there tonight. And they nailed them all over town. Wanted, young, skinny, wiry fellas. Hey, man, I ain't young no more, and I, uh, I can be skinny and wiry, though, bless God. Amen. Amen. And I want to tell you tonight, brother, you hear me, that demands were on this rider. I tell you what, boys, we need some of you young men to sign up tonight. I mean, to get on that pony and begin to ride for God. Any little old sissy can live for the, the devil. Listen, you know what they done? They got them boys up. I, I ain't got no cowboy hat tonight. But I tell you what they done, they got them a good hat. And, boy, they got them a good pair of boots. And boy, they put their blue jeans on. I mean, they didn't come in there looking like Eminem, you know, or Snoop Dogg, Poop Dogg, whatever his name is. I mean, they didn't come in there like some kind of uh, wannabe from down in the ghetto somewhere. I tell you, brother, they signed up and they said, I'm willing to risk death daily. A lot of these boys say, I'm tough, man. I'm a football player, man. I'm a football player at my school, man. I'm tough and that. You want to see how brave they are? Say, here, here's a handful of tracks. Let's go give them out. They say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I ain't doing that. Huh? They're chicken! I mean, brave enough to play football and won't even step out there hand somebody a gospel track on the street corner, you big chicken. Uh, you sissy, you whip. What is wrong with you? I'm telling you, boy, I know grown boy, big old 18, 19 year old boys, they ain't enough money in Morgan to pay up to get out there and give a testimony in church. Chicken! God can't use you. He wants some young, skinny, wiry fellers. As they say in West Virginia, yeah. it ends in ER. Hey, man, I'm going to tell you something, brother. They signed them up. And notice what it says about these men. First of all, they must be little men. They must be little men. Now, I'm not about physically, but you understand what I'm saying. Willing to risk death daily. Hey, man, 130 pounds. That's what they had to be. That's why a little Joe could be one. I don't see nobody in here could be a Pony Express rider. Him, he might make it. I weighed 135 when I was a senior in high school, and I weigh a little more than that now, about 15 pounds more, uh, but I'm overweight. 
I mean, them boys had to be 130 pounds. 130 pounds. I mean, they had to be little men. You ever heard of old Wild Bill Cody? He weighed 126 pounds. He had only back of his blue jeans that said waist 28. And, brother, only 200 of them little boys can make it. He, he, listen, he wasn't like you teenagers nowadays. Some little overgrown couch potato who lays around all day and watches TV. They had to be young, skinny, wild. Fellers. Amen. And boy, I'll tell you what, them little old boys come and they lined up. Now, what's the point in that? God wants little men. God can't use big people. I'm not talking about physically. I'm not talking about how tall you are, how big you are. I'm talking about if you're full of yourself and full of pride, God can't use you. Listen, God can't use some people. They're like a blessed peacock. They walk into church like, here I am, you know, the great so-and-so. Here's brother so-and-so. Here's brother, and the Lord goes, ah, ah. I can't right there, brother. If there's one thing God hates in his people, it's pride, brother. I'm going to tell you something here tonight. You ain't nothing. I ain't nothing. It's only the grace of God Almighty that any of us is here tonight. And if you ever step your foot through the pearly gates, it'll be because the blood of Jesus and the grace of God plus nothing. You got to be a little man for God to use you. You watch God quit. You watch God quit using people when they start thinking there's hot snot. You ain't hot snot. You're a cold booger. I'm telling you what, brother. You ain't as tough as you think you are. We ought to be little men. Amen. They're little men. They had to take an oath. These little boys come and signed up to be a Pony Express rider, and they 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 had to take an oath. And when they told them they had to take an oath that they would not drink alcohol. Isn't that something? Isn't that something that the United States government had more standards on than the, than the churches do now? Yeah. You could not drink alcohol. Why? Because they know you couldn't carry the mail effectively and get it delivered where it needed to be if you had alcohol in your system. God gave it the same way. Listen, if your mind's messed up on some alcohol or drugs, you're not going to be able to deliver the mail. You're not going to be able to do what God wants you to do because you have to have your system right. And then they had to take an oath not to swear. They couldn't cuss. Now, what does that have to do with delivering the mail? I don't know. I guess they figured if a man will cuss, he'll cut out on us somewhere else. I don't know. But if you cuss, you couldn't be a Pony Express rider. Isn't that something? What about that? I don't want to talk about that tonight just a little bit. I want to say, and under the demands of the rider, the most important thing there was was the mail. The most important thing. You thought I was going to say the man, didn't you? The man's not the most important thing. The male is the most important thing. Now, I want to say tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and I've been around a long time. I know what's going on. I've been in independent Baptist churches for 30 years. I know them backwards and forwards. I know all the different groups and what they believe and who don't like who and who don't agree with who and all that kind of stuff. I learned that 25 years ago. And I'm going to tell you what's wrong with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, what's killing us is, brother, we have got to the point where we have thanked Mr. So-and-so, brother so-and-so. We can't get like, he's our leader. He's our hero. Listen, the man's not the most important thing. The male is the most important thing. I'm not important tonight, and you're not either. It's the male, brother. It don't matter if I live or die. It's the male. It don't matter if you live or die. It's the male. Brother, God got along time before you got here and he'll be doing just fine when me and you are gone. It's the mail that's important tonight. I've heard people say, well, if I don't get the Sunday school class I want, I'll just quit church. It's not important what you want. The mail's what's important. Amen? The mail's more important than your feelings. I heard people say, well, if they say one more thing to my kid, I'll tell you what you ought to do. Shut your mouth and go to the altar and ask God to help you realize the male is the most important thing. I got three girls here tonight. You ask them, brother. You hear? ask them back there tonight. I've always told them if somebody does you wrong, let it go. Let it go. We ain't starting no fight in the church. We ain't solving no problems in the house of God. The male getting delivered is the most important thing. Not your feelings. Not that scratch on your car. Not your baby getting his ear bit in the nursery. It's the male, brother. The male's what's important. Hey, man. That's right. You know what the next most important thing was? The horse. I don't care how good a fella was. He didn't have no good horse. He wasn't going nowhere. 
I don't know, maybe, I guess this is the only thing I can use for a horse tonight. I hate to, but here's what they done. Is they got them little boys and they saddle them up. And they got them on there. Lord, that's a big, giant, flat rider. Something. And it's a fat little bugger, ain't he? And boy, they put them on there and they'd say, all right, are you ready? And they'd kick them like that real good. And get them stirred in there. And there you go. That horse, see? That horse was the most, the second most important thing. The horse. Listen, in 1860, you could buy a good horse for $50. 50 bucks, you could buy a good horse. You know how much they paid for the Pony Express riders? Horses, to give you a little example of what 50 bucks is worth, land was 25 cents an acre. 25 cents an acre. Of course, if you've ever been to Nebraska and Montana and Nevada, you know why. That's about what it's worth now. But anyway, you can buy land 25 cents an acre, and these horses were $50. You know how much they paid for the ponies them boys rode? $200. The finest horse that a money can buy. And they got them thoroughbreds, grain fed, raised just for the purpose of running. You know why? Because the horse is the vehicle by which the mail has took place. That's a picture of a church getting the mail out. Let me tell you something here tonight. Listen, this church is more important than me or you. Shiny Light Baptist Church, whatever church you're a member of tonight. Listen, I've heard people say, well, it just costs a lot to run them buses. They bought the best horse horses that money could buy. No expenses barred to get the mail out there. I used to hear people say, I used to hear people say all the time, oh no, we're going to have another missionary. A missionary. I bet it's boring when them missionaries come. We have to give money to the missionaries. Listen, brother, they bought the very best horses that money could buy to get that mail wherever it was going. So, they got some little boys out there and then here come the rider. Them boys was 18. Some of them snuck in at 17 and one even 16 years of age and boy they they, uh, they they got them on there and they had to lay aside every weight 130 pounds soaking wet and full of bananas and they set up there boy and they got them on there and they said all right and they paid them fifteen hundred dollars a week what we would make now it's probably about four dollars or something it's equivalent to fifteen hundred dollars a week now that's pretty good money but they had a 24-hour day job and risk death daily. Amen? Now, if a man's willing to do his job right, I mean, God will pay you well. Amen. The Lord will pay you. Amen? God's always paid me well when I rode my pony and delivered the mail. So, they got them little boys up there. Here, son, you've been chosen. Here, son, you've been chosen. Now, you report here at 6 o'clock Monday morning. And they got him out there. They got his pony. They got him out here. Now, you need to get to know this little thing. And you get on there. And you get all saddled up. And, boy, you get everything in your hand. You get ready to go like this. And he said, all right, we're ready now. And he said, now, you ready to deliver the mail? You got 75 miles on this little thing. And they gave him three things besides the mail. You know what they gave him? They gave him a bottle of water, a 44 pistol, yes, and a special edition printed copy of the King James Bible. Yeah. That's a fact. That's a fact. You can look it up on the internet and see a picture of them. Special edition for the Pony Express. I'd love to have one of them things. I'll find one in a museum one of these days and still. Look at it. And, uh, and brother, I'll tell you what. Brother, you hear me? That thing out there, it's going to shut And listen, I'll tell you, boy, that little old boy, I brought this too tonight. I have my King James Bible. And what they've done is they got him here. So he got his 44. Now, I'm going to have to take this off to do this. And they saddled him up. This is my daddy, so don't nobody say nothing about it. And they put him on there. And boy, I got a knife too, but this ain't 1860. This is 2005, and them boys didn't have to ride to Atlanta. So here we go. They got him on there, and they got him all saddled up, and he's ready. Hey, Amen. You go tell all your friends the preacher pulled a gun on you, sir, Friday night. Hey, Amen. I've had one pulled on me. I can pull it on you. Well, anyway, that is, it ain't loaded, I don't think. But anyway, 
Uh, they got him on there, and they got him saddled up. Now, listen, brother. If a man got a good pony and, and a 44 and a bottle of water in a King James bottle, it don't get no better than that. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I mean, what good, what more does a man want? Then a bottle of water, a good horse, a King James Bible, and a 44 pistol. You can't beat that. Yes, These modern day Christians, they ain't got a clue what's going on. You say, Lord, have mercy. You're one of them gun toting preachers. Listen, I think every Christian ought to buy him a good gun. It's a deterrent to crime. Yes, Amen. You see, if that fellow thinks you're going to blow his head off, he ain't going to come in and rob your house and rape your wife and kill your kids. I mean, just put it on. This don't go in the newspaper, I'm telling you, man. I'm going to sue somebody. You confiscate that for me, Brother Ray. What? Anyway, but I'm going to tell you something tonight. Brother, they, listen, them boys got on it. They got on their pony. Here they went down the road. And boy, I'll tell you what, they begin to ride. Amen? They begin to ride. Now, you know why they give them that gun? There's one reason why they had a gun. To defend that male. That's the only reason they had a gun. It wasn't so they could go hunting. It wasn't so they could just target practice. The only time they was authorized to use that gun is when they had to use it to defend the male and get it through. Not for personal gain or pleasure. Not to shoot the other Pony Express rider riding by that they disagreed with. I ought to just stop that for 15 minutes. We got it all wrong now, don't we? I know preachers that wouldn't have nothing to preach if I died. All they do is bow, bow, bow. There he goes, bow. I had one shoot me on the Internet the other day. I was going to preach somewhere, and a preacher emailed this other preacher. He said, I can't believe you're letting him preach. I can't believe you're coming here him preach. He, and then the guy got real jealous. He said, I guess if I had a big church, you would let me come down there. This is a preacher down in South Carolina. And I told the guy, he said, well, if you could preach, I'd probably let you come. Uh, but listen, brother, I'll tell you what. Brother, they, they, they'll shoot you. They'll, 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 they're like this. Preachers are like this now. They sit around in the relay station drinking coffee and gossiping, and here comes somebody riding in on their pony, and they go, bow. I don't like his boots. Bow. I don't like something he said the other day. Bow. I don't, that ain't why we got a gun. Our gun's not to shoot each other. Our, our gun is to defend the male. Are you listening to me tonight? They'll keep your guns off each other, you lazy bum, and get out there and carry the mail and do something for God and get the mail tagged through. I'm sick and tired of these preachers that all they can do is criticize brother so-and-so and criticize brother so-and-so, and I don't like this, and I don't agree with that. Get on your pony and take the mail out. Hey, man. Hey, man. I ain't got time to stop and argue with you. If you want to pray, we'll pray. If you want counsel, I'll do my best. But I ain't got five minutes to wait when nobody in here counts or uh, unless it turns into an argument. I've got a pony to ride. I got somewhere to go. I'm going somewhere. You can go or sit down and criticize whatever you want to do. But I want to go somewhere. Amen. The male. And then I want to talk about the danger of the ride. Whew. See the great outdoors. Yeah, boy. Across the country on a horse in 1860. These engines out there. And them engines don't like white people. And they, they catch you coming through their territory at night, your scalp's gone. It's dangerous. It was dangerous. Many dangers, tolls, and snares. They had to face the elements. Think about that tonight. All these old movies of John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Marshall Dillon. They were some tough characters, brother. So they get shot in the shoulder, ride a horse 15 miles, and beat up Indians. I don't believe that, but it, but it looks good. I got shot right here. Man, boy shot me, a friend of mine, when I was 15 years old, playing with a gun and pointed it right toward my chest and pulled the trigger, and it didn't go off. And then he pointed at me again and said, you want me to shoot you? And I said, get that thing out of my face, and put my hand like that, and went, pow, right through my hand. You can see where we're in right there, and come out right there. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not the toughest person in the world, but I'm pretty tough. 
And I just don't believe that you can ride a horse 15 miles with a bullet in your shoulder and beat up Indians. When I'm telling you, I thought I was dying. And you know what they'll do? Clint Eastwood and them dudes, John, they'll, they'll, they'll have this nurse. There's always a pretty nurse in the movie. And he'll see, he got an arrow sticking in his chest right here. He'll say, cut it out. She'll take a knife, he'll give him a swig of whiskey like that and say, cut it. And she'll, I don't believe that. I mean, I mean that might happen, but I'm telling you, they're a lot tougher now. When I got shot, I hit, the bullet hit me like that, and I didn't fall down, but it knocked me all the way around like that. And I went through the house, blood pour, pouring down in the, in the, in the hallway. And his mama come down the hallway and said, whoa, she like to pass out. And they took me up out of Marion to the hospital, and I sat there and bled a big pile in on the floor. Before they ever got this swelled up that big around, and I'm telling you, it's dangerous. Well, it was for them little boys out there. They would see Mirage, where it looked like there was water, and there was no water. There was rattlesnakes. There was all kinds of predators, coyotes, wolves, bears, lions, and all kinds of things. 119 in the shade, there wasn't no shade. That's right, brother. I mean, I'm telling you, brother, it was freezing cold, uh, snow drifts four and five, six feet deep. I'm telling you, sometimes them little boys had to cut pieces of wood and put it on the bottom of their feet or their shoes and lead their horse through the snow, five and six foot drifts of snow. But they kept on going and kept on going. And one little old boy, they said he rode his 75 miles. And when he got to the next relay station, the other guy was sick. He had to ride another 75 miles. And that made him 150 miles on a horse. Uh, you have no idea how that would make you feel. I mean, some of you people, we got some people in here who got horses. Max got horses. You, you got horses, ain't you, Sister Terry? Um, so they've got horses. Have you ever rode 100 miles straight? I'm telling you, you wouldn't be able to walk. I'm telling you, listen, I'm, boy, this little thing here, I mean, think about this, 15, 20, let's go, let's go, man, let's go, and boy, giddy up, and you're going down through there, and, and shake your guts out. I'm telling you, boy, your, your innards are let go on the inside. I'm, it, it mess you up. I ain't kidding you. He rode that horse 150 miles. And you know what? It wasn't a little exciting romantic ride. And, brother, when he come into the relay station, he was sound asleep, and he had the mail tied around his body, sent no pumps over asleep like that. And his horse come in. I know some people won't even go to church. When it rains, a few drops. I know people that won't go if there's four flakes of snow. Oh boy, no church today. You're a loser. You'll never amount to nothing if you let a little opposition stop you. One of them boys lied about his age. He wasn't a 16. And he, he lied and told him he's 18. And he got in, got to be a Pony Express rider, and it was one of the only times in history they took that mail 650,000 miles, and it only fell like twice. And that little boy's out there riding, and he had his gun, and they said seven Indians come around him, circled him, like that. And he didn't know what to do. He said, I ain't giving in, I ain't giving up. And they come out there the next day looking for him when he never showed up, and they found that little old fella face down in the sand. And he had his arms around that male laying there. And there were seven dead Indians around him in a circle. He said, bless God, if I'm going down, you're going with me. And I'm going to take out as many as I can. I preached that somewhere, and this fellow came up to me after service. He said, now, he didn't have but a six-shot gun. How'd he kill seven Indians? I said, oh, he's good. He waited until two of them got right in the road. Pow! Went shot through and shot two of them at the same time. I don't know how he did it. That's what the story said. Let's roll off. One of the great men of our day, he had that mail, brother, in that airplane when that thing went down, and they said they found Brother Roloff with his arms wrapped around a King James Bible laying there, of course. Now, I'm going to tell you tonight, there's too many boys quit. There's too many of you preach three or four sermons and never do it again. Grab a hold of that thing, hop on your pony, and say, glory to God, I'm going to ride till they shoot me off, or I'm going to ride till I drop over dead, but I'm carrying the mail on through. Yeah. See, sometimes it's pretty weather. 
Sometimes it was exciting. He'd ride and all the pretty young ladies would be at the relay station and say, Oh, there's little Joe. Oh. And he got to see these pretty girls. He said, back where I come from, they wasn't but two girls in our town. One of them was so buck tooth she could eat an apple through a chain link fence. And he said the other was Myrtle or something like that. And she used to hump back and cross-eyed when she cried, tears run down her back. And he said, I want to go out here. And he said, I want to find me a, a, you know, but he couldn't stop and see his girlfriend. He couldn't stop and corrals around. He couldn't stop. He had to go and get the mail through. You can't let somebody stop you. I know boys that do pretty good for God till they get a girlfriend. And they ain't worth a dime after that. If your girlfriend makes you quit serving God, I don't think the Lord gave you that girlfriend. Amen. That's right. The dangers of the ride. David Livingston, a great missionary to South Africa. That old boy went down to South Africa to try to convert the heathen. And when he's down there, he, you know what he done? Went three years away from his wife. Half two case. Didn't have no choice. Lord have mercy. I hear these preachers' wives complain. Everywhere I go, I meet preachers' wives say, well, I don't, I'm just not happy no more. I'm going to leave him. He's gone too much. Man's gone three years. She didn't know if he's alive or dead. But when he finally got to see his wife, he said, honey, I, I love you and I miss you. And she said, I don't even want to tell you the bad news for the joy that I have of seeing your face. And he turned around and went back to South Africa. And he was out there one, one night in a, in a, in a, with his rifle and, and a lion, an a, a African lion, came out and nearly ripped his left arm off and left him crippled like that. And he had to learn how to shoot his gun left-handed like that and pull the trigger like this. And he stayed there. Somebody said, well, my wife left me, so I guess I better quit. You listen, listen. You get back on your pony, and you keep riding. God didn't call her. He called you. And if God called you, you ride that pony until it drops off from under you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And that's what the world can't stand. Like Dusty was talking, that's why they hate our guts, because we won't quit. You know, I'd be a nice fellow if I'd just quit. Everybody would say, poor old brother Danny, he's a nice guy. You know, I really like him. But because I won't quit, they say, ugh. Uh, uh, uh. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm telling you, God gave me the mail, and the Lord said, take it on over there, and I've got a job to do. And I intend on doing it. I don't have to ask your opinion or advice. Amen. Sometimes the skies were blue. Sometimes they're going out through there saying, man, this is the life. And that's where the ministry is. <whistles> Skies are blue. Spurt weather's perfect. Drink out of that water. Take you, a, uh, take you 44 and pow. Shoot you a big rabbit. Cook it for dinner. Living high on the hog. And then sometimes the sky got dark. And coyotes were hollering and screaming out there in the, in the, in the forest. And it's miserable and sick. That's the way the ministry is. That's the way the Christian life is. It's not always glory. These crazy nuts on TV that tell you when you get saved, everything's going to be all right and you ain't never going to get sick and you're always going to have a new car and get your bills paid, that's a bunch of junk, people. That ain't the Christian life. You're in for it. You're in for it. If you guys are going to preach, you have a clue what you're in for. You gotta have a backbone, Lord have mercy, a double dose of grace, courage, guts, a young, skinny, why fellers? I've been there. I've been riding a long time. I've seen the pretty weather. I've seen it when the glory falls and people getting saved everywhere you look and you don't even have to. I've preached on tithing. A bunch of 15 people get saved. I mean, brother, when it's like that, it's right, man. I mean, it's right. I mean, you can shake a bush and a bunch of people fall out of it and get saved. I've seen it. And then I've seen it when it was so dry. Lord, you'd have to prime a man before he could spit. You couldn't have. I'm telling you, it was awful. I've been in some services as tight as a banjo string. And then I've been in some, boy, where the glory of God just, I mean, sometimes the sun's shining. 
and sometimes, but you just keep right on riding. Amen. Boy, I tell you, I've rode some, you get to see a lot of the great west. I have. Man, I've seen Niagara Falls riding my pony in the Grand Canyon. I've been all over on top of the Empire State Building in New York City. Priests all over Myrtle Beach, Daytona Beach, Miami, Florida, the Bahamas, out on Chicago up here on top of that uh, big Sears Tower. I preached all around Dallas and all over around Atlanta, Detroit, Michigan, Los Angeles, Beverly Hills. I've been in that big old castle over yonder in New uh, Schweinstein uh, Castle in Germany that they patterned the Disney uh, uh, world after. Been inside that thing, man. Looked off down in the mountains. I, oh, Lord, I've been on the Queen Mary out on the other side of Los Angeles in the Spruce Goose, that big old airplane, eat goat meat down in Haiti. Uh, brother, I, I tell you what, boy, I've been in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Connecticut, Maryland, Washington, D.C., West Virginia, T Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, all over South Carolina, North Carolina. Son, I've got to see a lot while I've been riding my pony. I've rode through and seen some good things. I've rode through and I've seen church splits. I've seen revivals. I've seen churches triple in attendance. Lord, have mercy. You that was with us in Marion that night, we've seen the largest church service that's ever been held in this part of the country at our youth rally under that tent. And I'm telling you, boy, it's all in the ride. Then I will say lastly tonight, the determination of the rider. They didn't have to only just be young, skinny, wiry fellows. They had to make up their mind that they was going to get that mail through or die trying. Now, we're lacking in that these days. We try something a time or two. If it don't work, we quit. We try something until it gets hard, then we give up. A little persecution or opposition come, we're ready to throw in the towel. Church don't want us. Job don't, you get fired. Family rebels, and you just quit and own God. Lord have mercy. Them little old boys got it rough. Rough, I mean rough. I've seen it rough. People don't know it. I mean, you know a lot, and I'm not going to say a lot because to protect the innocent and the guilty. But I'm telling you what, man, I could write you a book of stuff I've seen riding my pony. My mom wrote on a tape here a few years ago about how she'd stay up to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning when she'd seen my car going up my driveway. And I've done that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Plan on doing it this year if the Lord lets me. If he don't, then I, I'm just a goner. But if he'll let me, I plan on doing it again this coming year. I remember night after night after night after night driving up that interstate there, that interstate there, 77, 85, 40, I 10, Charlotte, I down, uh, from, up in, from Jacksonville, across to Pensacola, from Atlanta, night after night after night when I didn't think I was going to make it. I've left them girls back there at home, told them two or three times on the way home. They'd call me at 12 o'clock at night and say, Daddy, how long is it going to be here before you get here? We're scared. I'd say, Honey, it's all right. You got the doors locked. Chris, that one there got a gun under a pillar. We're in a room right now, if any of y'all got any ideas about coming over when I'm gone. I can't believe you. Let your, oh, just shut up. Shut up. I'll do the best I can. They're my kids. I'll try to raise them the best I can. Lord, I could give you some stories tonight. Lord, when they was little, we'd go down the road. I'd have to go preach somewhere. My Lord, you just don't, you ain't never had a life till you got three little girls. And I mean, there, we'd get up on Sunday morning, I'd be changing diapers, had the phone in this hand, my Sunday school lesson right here. And one, I had one trying to change a diaper with one hand and got a church member on the other line saying, I don't think I can make it this morning, Brother Denny. One of the kids is sick. Please, give me a break. Husband and wife. And boy, I'm telling you, they'd come through there with chocolate milk spilled on the dress, and it'd be time to go, and I'd say, Honey, I'm the pastor. We can't be late. Get in the car. She'd say, I'm sick. I said, Prove it. Throw up. If you ain't too sick, if you can't throw up, you ain't sick. They say, well, I did. Blah. I say, okay, you feel better now. Let's go to church. <laughs> Amen. I remember one time, Corey, Corey back there, where's she at? Uh, 
Where is she? Raise your hand back up. Uh, what are you doing on that side? She was sick when she was little and about that time. I was telling somebody about this yesterday. And she was sick, real sick. And they told me, they said, now, Danny, you better get some nose drops in her nose because she couldn't breathe. And so, I mean, she was about 20 months old, 22 or 3 months old. And I took that little squirt and I said, okay, honey. You know, you're supposed to squirt me down. You're supposed to go. And suck it up your nose like that. Well, she didn't want to suck. Who in the right mind would want to suck that stuff up your nose? I tried to squirt it up in her nose. She wouldn't do it. I said, come on, baby. Uh, let's see you breathe. And I'd hoo, 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 suck like that, and she wouldn't. And they said, you got to get them nose drops in her. And I took her, I took her with this hand like that and put her feet right here and let her hang upside down. And she's hanging completely upside down. And, ah! and I took them things and just squirted them in both sides of her nose like that. I know that ain't the way you're supposed to do it. Mr. Genius, why don't you tell me how? I mean, carry my oldest one by that. We'd come home one night, and this crazy woman was after us, and we thought she was going to kill us. And when the, the back door was open, there's a bag laying out in the backyard. She said, Daddy, she's here. I said, now, hush, carry. She's not here. She said, she's here, Daddy. She's going to kill us. I know she is. So how many of y'all remember who I'm talking about, you know? big girl, and she, she'd try to steal Chris and Corey, and one time I was at the altar praying like this, and I was praying hard, and I felt something slide up under my arm. I thought, my goodness, that a prayer request or something? She wrote me a big letter about three pages long, and she went over to McDowell Tech and told everybody that me and her got married. And everybody at McDowell Tech said, he married a retarded person. <laughs> and uh, I, that ain't even the 100th. That ain't even the 100th. Well, anyway, she said, Daddy, she's in the house. Well, you know, the more she started, I started getting scared. I said, Lord, maybe she is in here. And you know, one gets scared, another gets scared. You start believing the devil, he'll show up. And I went and got a butcher knife about that long, and Carrie held on to my arm. And I said, girls, y'all go in there and get in the room. Shut the door. We went into every room in the house with that butcher knife. Carrie holding on to my arm. She'd open the door, and I'd go, how like that? She ain't in there. I said, she ain't under the bed. She couldn't get under that bed. We'd open up her closet. I said, she's got to be in there. I don't reckon she's in there. I don't know. She left in the middle of the night or something. I remember in Tennessee, I told you before they took me to, I preached a youth camp in Tennessee. They said, now, preacher, here's where you're going to be staying. Just riding my pony, trying to do my job. I ride, and they said, now, they put me in a little trailer. One of them little bitty camper trailers about along from here to that wall right there. The kind where you walked on one side, the whole thing moved like this. Yeah. Walked on the other side, the whole thing moved like this. Yeah. My Lord, it was hot. Oh, gosh, it was hot. That bathroom, how in the world? You had to be a Pony Express rider to use that bathroom. It, the door was about this big. And you couldn't just walk in it. You had to turn around and aim and just back in there and sit down. That's the only way you get in it. Most of you would have never got in there. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I thought, who'd they make this thing for them blessed things right in them UFOs live here? And, you know, they, they, they put me in there. And it was about 95 degrees outside in the middle of July, and the kids were staying in the dorms, and they put me in the camper. And I was always taught by Brother Ed Maccabee, people like that were my mentors when I first got saved. And Brother Ed said, you, when you go somewhere to preach, you take what they give you and keep your mouth shut. You don't go and say, well, I demand this, and I, I've got to have a motel. I, Shut up. You ought to be in jail or hell. <coughs> Amen. So I kept my mouth shut, like Brother Ed said. And, when, and while I was laying down, I felt something crawling on me in the bed, and, I, and it was a tick. I said, oh, my goodness. I, I throwed it in the trash can, and there was nothing on me. And there's a bunch of them in my bed. Just riding my pony, minding my own business. And I remember going to sleep. I said, I'm not going to complain if it's what you want me to have, Lord. And I stuck my fingers in my ears, this, just like this, and got up in a fetal position and went to sleep. Because I thought, well, they, they ain't going to go in my mouth. And I can't stand the thoughts of a tick crawling in my ear and getting in there and hatching out stuff and, and eating me and making me go crazy. I'll go crazy if ticks start hatching out in my ears. 
So I plugged them up like this and went to sleep. It's awful. But then the weather clears up. I get a plane ticket in the mail one day. And the plane ticket's to Rochester, New York. And I just go sit down on the airplane, and they feed you a nice meal. And I get off, and somebody's there to pick me up. Hey, Brother Castle. Hey, Brother Castle. The pastor said to here. He takes me over there to the big Hilton down there. Down there. He puts me up in the motel. He said, are you hungry? We have a little red lobster right here. There's a steakhouse right there. I said, no. He said, here's $100. This will do you a couple of days to eat on. They put me in a big, Lord, you wouldn't believe what a room. Big old room. I mean, a motel room, it's like a little house. It had a living room. It had two or three. Uh, you ever been in a motel room? It had three phones. Phones, different phones. I had a, one of them caduces over there, boy, and it bubbled all over the place. And man, I'm telling you, I just ride my pony, brother, and go in there and eat steak and eat shrimp, brother. And then next week, I'm going to South Carolina, and I got a whole youth group crowded me around the uh, wall and started pointing their fingers in my face and blessed me out. I drove 500 miles. And the pastor wouldn't even speak to me, did not speak a word to me after it was over. And the youth leader, a lady, got in my face and says, you have no right to judge these people and preach about their music and all of that. And I just stood there against the wall and let them bless me out and got on my pony and rode back home. You just ride on. Sometimes it's pretty weather. Sometimes it's awful. Lord, I've been in Germany when I was sick as a dog back about 1988, and I was so sick I thought I was dying and couldn't. Uh, staying with these people, I didn't even know who they, I didn't know how to say their name. I, I couldn't understand the word they said. They couldn't understand the word I said. And I laid in the bed for hours and hours. I, one time I, I had a kidney stone uh, going crazy on me. And if you ever had a kidney stone, you know what it's like? And I was in Colorado. I had to fly home all day long on an airplane. And I got on this airplane. And I don't like to sit down anyway. I don't like to sit down no time. I think sitting down's crazy. I, I don't like to sit down. That's why I'm the preacher. So I can get up here and run around the whole service. But they told me, they said, you've got to sit down, sir. And I said, I am about to die. I got to, and that woman said, you sat down. And I said, I'm hurting. She said, and I sat there, it seemed like, for 10 hours on that airplane. I thought I was going to die. Before we finally got home, I didn't even know what was wrong with me. Oh, yeah, boy, it's all, it's all in there. Man, I've got to preach till I was soaking wet and preached many times, seen people saved like I couldn't talk, preached with a fever of 103 or 4 and, and uh, freeze to death, run the heater all the way there and back, and just keep on going. Preach when it's easy. Preach when it's hard. Preach when they want to hear you. Preach when they don't want to hear you. Preach when they like it. Preach when they don't like it. Just ride that thing, brother. Just ride that pony and keep on riding. I'm seeing the ice in my kitchen sink. In the house, ice froze. And hang a curtain up there so the girls wouldn't get cold when we lived in that one little house in Nebo. And I had an old van that wouldn't start, and I had to... Push it off my fingers, froze solid, trying to get to where I had to preach down in Charlotte. And the pipes busted underneath the house, and the family no, with no water. <coughs> Not to mention all the other stuff. And I want your sympathy tonight. I'm a blessed individual. Amen. God's been good to me. Amen, About that time you'll ride that pony, some old drunk out of a saloon will come out and encourage. Some of the best compliments I've ever been paid was by some old drunk. I don't trust preachers. They come, they'll meet me uptown and say, God bless you, Brother Castle. I heard your work's doing good. I think you're good. Now, that's what they think. Big hypocrite. Big hypocrite. They don't even, well, well we don't acknowledge him. He's not, we don't say his name, you know, like, cuss word. Same, I like him drunks. As a drunk told me one time, he'd come to hear me preach two or three nights. Paid me one of the best compliments I ever been paid. He heard me preach two or three nights, and he never did get saved. And they brought him up after church, and he shook my hand. Now, don't get mad at me, I'm just going to say what he said, okay? And he, he said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing, Danny. You one hell of a preacher. <laughs> That's what he said. I said, God bless you, man. That's the best compliment I've ever had. <laughs> now, that tore some of you up, and I didn't mean that bad. I'm just telling you what the man said, brother. I tell you what, God will send somebody along to encourage you a little bit once yeah. in a while. Amen. 
He has to use an old drunk. I count that one of the best compliments I've ever been paid. Lord, I've done it then, didn't I? Well, I'm closing tonight different than I've done this before. And they said this. Somebody sent me one this one time and I was going through the worst time of my life. I don't know who wrote it. But it talks about a race that we're all running. Give me on this one, Brother Roy. And the title of this little poem is The Race. I hope it will be a blessing to you, and I'm through. I said this one little old boy, he was riding around on his horse trying to deliver the mail, and his horse the, the, slipped off a cliff, off of a cliff, and it broke the horse's leg and had to shoot the horse. And it broke one of his legs. And he tied the mail around his neck and climbed up to the top of that cliff and drug his body, his self, nine miles to the next relay station with his hands. And they said, when that, when that boy come, he said his hands was bleeding and his tongue was black. And when he got to the threshold of that relay station, he died, but he brought the mail in. Sometimes I feel like my leg's broke. Sometimes I feel like I'm both mine's broke, Amen. and I'm just dragging myself. But I don't want to disappoint the Lord and give up. Amen. I'd rather go in on crutches than not go in. That's right. I'd rather drag myself in than quit back yonder in the dust somewhere and let the mail there's people depending on us to get the mail to them. The race. Quit. Give up. You're beat. They shout and plead. There's just too much against you now. This time you can't succeed. And as I started to hang my head in front of failure's face, my downward fall is broken by the memory of a race. And hope refills my weakened will as that scene, I recall that scene. For just the thought of that short race rejuvenates my being. It was a children's race. Young men, young men. Now I remember well. Excitement, sure. But also fear. It wasn't hard to tell. They all lined up so full of hope. Each one thought to win. Or tie for first. Or if not that, at least take second place in that race. And fathers watched from off the side, each cheering for his son. And each boy hoped to show his dad that he would be the one who won. The whistle blew and off they went, young hearts and hopes on fire. To win, to be the hero there, was each boy's young desire. And one boy in particular, his dad was in the crowd, was running near the lead and thought, my dad will be so proud. But as he speeded down the field across a shallow dip, the little boy who was to win lost his step and slipped. Amen. Trying hard to catch himself, his hands flew out to brace, and mid the laughter of the crowd, he fell flat upon his face. So down he fell, and with him hope, he couldn't win it now. Embarrassed, sad, he only wished to disappear somehow. But as he fell, his dad stood up and showed his anxious face, which to the boy so clearly said, Get up and win that race. He quickly rose, no damage done, behind a bit, that's all, and he ran with all his mind and might to make up for his fall. So anxious to restore himself, to catch up and to win, his mind went faster than his legs. He slipped and fell again. He wished that he had quit before with only one disgrace. I'm hopeless as a runner now. I shouldn't even try to race. But in the life and crowd, he searched and found his father's face that steadily looked up and said again, get up and win that race. So he jumped up to try again, 10 yards behind, 
the last. If I'm going to gain those yards, he said, I've got to run really fast. Exceeding everything he had, he regained eight or ten, but trying hard to catch the lead, he slipped and fell again. Defeat. He lay there silently. A tear dropped from his eye. There's no sense in running anymore. Three strikes, I'm out. Why well, try? The will to rise had disappeared. All hope had fled away. So far behind, so error prone, closer all the way. I've lost, so what's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, whom soon he would have to face. Get up! An echo sounded low. Get up and take your place. You're not meant for failure here. Get up and win that race. With borrowed will, get up, it said, you haven't lost it all. For winning is not more than this, to rise each time you fall. So up he rose to win once more. And with a new commit, he resolved that win or lose, at least he wouldn't quit. So far behind the others now, the most he'd ever been. Still, he gave it all he had and ran as though to win. Three times he'd fallen stumbling. Three times he rose again. Too far behind to hope to win, he still ran until the end. They cheered the winning runner as he crossed first place, head high, proud, and happy, no falling, no disgrace. But when the fallen youngster crossed the line last place, the crowd gave him a great cheer because he finished the race. And even though he came in last with head bound low, unproud, you would have thought he'd won that race to listen to that crowd. And to his dad, he sadly said, I didn't do so well. To me, you won, the father said. You rose each time you fell. Yep. And now when things seem dark and hard and difficult to face, the memory of that little boy helps me in my race. For all of life is like that race with ups and downs and all. And all you have to do to win is rise each time you fall. Quit. Give up. You're beat. They still shout in my face. But another voice within me says, get up and win the race. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Y'all come on, Brother Jason, get that song for me. I'm going to have you sing it in a minute. Miss Desi, play something softly right now. <laughs> 